Today, our speaker of the day is going to be Rod Edwards, who I'll call up here in a couple of minutes. Uh, interestingly, on the 30th of June 1930, after a construction period of about two years, Captain Charles Nesbitt, a well-known pilot in Western Australia, took an aircraft on its maiden flight after it had been built at Beverley. In attendance was Captain Frank Briggs and Captain Ed Edgar Johnson who were noted aviators in Western Australia and Australia. On the return from the maiden flight, Captain Nesbitt said that the aircraft was handled extraordinarily well and he compared it to a gypsy moth. This was no mean feat for the person who built it because he had no aeronautical experience. It was, in fact, the grandfather of Rod, who's here today. After the maiden flight, the aircraft made another four flights where um, Selby Ford, the builder, was taken for a, a fly. His helper, Tom Shackles, was taken for a fly. And their two sisters were taken on subsequent flights. The girls assisted uh, with the, the fabric of the aircraft. You can imagine the, the feeling of the young man flying in his aeroplane, which he'd spent two years building. Hard work carried out away from mainstream aviation. The aircraft wasn't approved and it flew about 50, between 50 and 100 hours. And since it couldn't be approved because there were no plans, it was suspended in the powerhouse at Beverley for nearly 30 odd years. It then went to the museum in Beverley for another 20 or 30 years. About four or five years ago, Rod, who was the legal owner of it because he was a direct descendant of the, the builder, decided that he would take the aircraft and re, refigure it, rebuild it. And so every nut and bolt, every stringer, every rib, every mechanical component was uh, examined carefully, re reassembled or replaced. And so you can imagine the enjoyment of Rod when he became airborne in it, probably just as excited as his grandfather was when he became airborne in 1930. It's a magnificent feat, and Rod's contribution to aviation in Western Australia, I think, is enormous. To have this aeroplane, which is nearly 80 years old, back in the air. Rod, would you like to come forward and tell us something about it? setting it up. Um, thanks for the intro and thanks for the invite. Um, yeah, it's been a hell of a feat. Um, a long couple of years and uh, I was hoping to bring the aeroplane today and park it out the front. Um, we'd organised that um, but unfortunately I had a bit of a setback recently and um, I've had to take the engine out again. So, so we weren't able to do it but anyway, maybe another time and hopefully you'll all see the aeroplane flying around and those, there are some people that have seen it. John, you've probably seen it a hundred times driving past your hangar. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'll just kick this thing off. Um, it's um, it should be playing now. I think I, I've just got it frozen okay. for a little bit. Yeah, um, it's called the Silver Centenary, um, and uh, the silver was the colour, and the centenary was supposed to be 1929, but he didn't quite finish it in time, and so it turned out to be uh, 1930 when he first flew it. Um, that's that's over Tyab in Victoria. Um, my wife in the front and I'm in the back. It's uh, quite a good Rob Fox with that. Um, during the video, we've got a, a bit of audio, and um, this is the ABC vision, so I'll just pause and, and let it fly through. That's what he loved doing. Sylvie Avonford. 
Edward was born in Beverly in 1900. As a youngster, he showed little aptitude for formal schooling, but a natural flair for anything electrical or mechanical. Taxied up and down a few times and took off. After half an hour, he landed, declaring the silver centenary was as safe as a church. Three days later, the silver centenary was flown to Maylands in Perth to a tumultuous welcome. But the celebrations were short lived. Without blueprints and comprehensive technical specifications, the authorities could not issue Ford with an airworthiness certificate. I think they've made up their mind that, that he wasn't going to be able to fly his aeroplane as he wanted to. Despite a year and a half of faultless flying, despite accolades of all kinds from professional pilots of the day, including the celebrated aviator Amy Johnson, the Silver Centenary was grounded permanently. Ford's hopes of a flying future were dashed forever. He's hung it in the roof of his powerhouse for 40 odd years. Every day, looking at it, probably thinking, gee, I'd love to be flying that today. And he wasn't able to because the regulators got in the way. The centenary was mothballed in 1933, but the town refused to allow Ford's legacy to be forgotten. The museum was opened in 1967, and the silver centenary took pride of place among the displays. The town's very, very proud of, and it's even on our crest. There, yeah, they're very proud of it. Put a nice little video together, but it's um, obviously not going to work for us. Um, yeah, this is going to be tough. <laughs> Where do we start? Um, Robbie Felton was employed um, to help me with the project. I, I didn't have the aeronautical knowledge, neither did my grandfather, mind you, but um, um, Robbie was the, uh, the main architect behind the restoration. Um, obviously, um, I was assisting him with it along the way, but uh, I don't think I could have picked a better fella to, to help us with it. Um, you know, these are the times when you get to pull an aeroplane like this out of the hangar and and um, and realise the you know the significance of it was is, is really quite amazing. Um, gee, Brian, this is going to be tough. <laughs> are you sure we can't have another go? Um, <laughs> try the other mic. Try the other mic. Brian loves the tablets. The flight was perfect, and for a man who had dreamed of this one moment for so long, and put in so much physical and mental effort, exhausted. Absolutely amazing, I think I cried, but uh, <laughs> you know, I took that up and they're all clapping and cheering. And mm -hmm. it was Thanks to her painstaking restoration, the Silver Centenary is once again living history and likely to stay that way for years to come. The kids are already lined up for the pilot's seat as well, so <laughs> it might go down another generation, so I heard the other day, so. But Rod Edwards is also keen to see that the Silver Centenary enjoys a little more of the spotlight than she did when she first took to the air in 1930. There's a lot of people that don't know about the history of this aeroplane and the red car and the chair. Is hoping that process will begin at the beginning back in Beverly. That'll be one of the first things we'll do, you know, and I owe that to the town and, and yeah, and I owe it to Selby and I owe it to the Silver Centenary. The technical technology has actually 
because we've got a gun, and we're hoping in the future we will fly beyond the doing free service of the town. I have a shot of it flying between Beverly and York and the air air shot, and I really want to reproduce that one. That one. Um, yeah, the video stops here for a sec, so I am talking so we can go with this one. Um, to go from there, um, obviously it was going to be a, a hell of a challenge, and, um, and then it was looking like that when I um, acquired the aeroplane about 10 years ago. Um, we knew we had to do something with it, but uh, I didn't realise I would actually go to get it like this. You know, I, I guess it was a challenge, and, and we, we, uh, we had a good go. Um, as I said earlier, um, I, I looked at a couple of people and I... I got um, given Robbie Felton's name and I think without Rob I, I don't think I would have been able to do it. He's just one of these magicians with his hands and he's able to um, able to uh, get something like that and um, and pull it to bits and put it back together again. It was it was really quite a challenge. Um, we did well, I'm often asked whether we used any of the original materials. All those long runs are all original and the cross members and yeah um, some of them we actually just pulled them apart, stripped them down and put them all back together again. It was as simple as that. But the, the, the ply and and some of the other materials were, were obviously well and truly gone. The, the aeroplane had casein glue as its um, main um, compound, so that was pretty handy because it allowed things to be pulled apart without without breaking them because it had all let go. Um, you can see here, this is a, one of the spars in the in the tailplane, I think, from memory. It was a fair bit of disrepair there, and, and that Oregon there that so uh, you can see there, um, that's the same Oregon. Um, yeah, beautiful wood, you know, it was all. 80 year old timber and some of it was absolutely fantastic. If you look at the sort of work that Robbie does, it's, um, it's a real credit to him. Um, the wings were something that people were really um, interested with because they're very flat base and quite a sharp leading edge. Everyone thought the aeroplane would really be a sharp store, but I can, I can tell you right now, it really does store, it just sits there, it's, it's a beautiful to fly. There was this, um, this metal rod down the, the, just behind the um, front spar and we, were, we didn't know what that was. We were trying to work out what the hell has he done here? And, in closer inspection, we realised what Selby had done is he had actually tried to make an internal aileron control mechanism inside the wing. But what had happened is that it mustn't have worked and he'd already, he'd already covered the fabric over the wing and rather than pulling the fabric apart, he just cut it off. And, um, and they, so they put the um, control surfaces for the ailerons underneath the wing and, um, and yeah, it was quite a, you know ugly design and it was probably not real practical. I was a bit worried about the... The, the mechanics of that. So one of the challenges was to, to change that. So we, we paid the seven pounds, I think, to to have ones, and uh, we, we recreated their disc opera, um, the differential system that they use on the Tiger Moth. So we recreated that and brought those cables back inside, and it just neatened it all up. And and I think it's it's a, a hell of a, a great job, and it's a lot better. Um, another section that was a bit of a challenge was was. The root fittings with the wings we were a bit nervous about whether they were good enough, so we packed. You know, we put a bit of a bit of a margin of safety in there. We packed them with a bit of steel and just to try and give it a bit of strength. We, we put the wings back on the old fuse one day, and that was a, a really good day. You know, you get to see the aeroplane starting to take shape, and these sort of things. You know, it takes a lot of time. You get anxious, and it's a lot of work involved. And that was that was quite a good day. Um, the controls, um, most of the controls inside were all pretty good. The problem we had is we had a rudder bar and we had a tail skid, and we needed a tail wheel and so therefore we needed some brakes. So what we decided to do is we decided to get some uh, Honda motorcycle braking systems, um, some master cylinders, and we made a bit of a tow brake system. An old chap with the name of George Cole, who might, some of you may know, um, he helped us invent it. And, and then we, we were thinking, well, we're gonna be trying to brake around the corner in a rudder, so we created this parallel bar system. And yeah, it's really unique, and I've had a few people ask me about it and how it works, and it's absolutely fantastic. And it's, um, and it's hidden away underneath the front seat, so you actually can't see it. And yet, it's such a modern design, and, and it really works works very well. And you can see there; it's, it's mounted on the machine. And um, and obviously, then we had uh, disc brakes. So everyone comments about the disc brakes in the machine. So they didn't have disc brakes back then. But yeah. the undercarriage was another area that, um, when the aeroplane was inspected by a chap named Major Colby, um, he found it was a bit weak. So my grandfather Selby obviously went away and and sourced a um, gypsy undercarriage, um, that one there, um, and from Larkham Aircraft Company, I think in Melbourne. And, um, and you can see the wheels there, they're quite a high um, radius wheel. Those tyres were put on afterwards, but the original tyres were, were a ball 
tyre, but you can see they had quite large wheels compared to a, 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 a gypsy moth of the day. So we wanted to recreate that, and the challenge then was to find a, a, a hub. And a chap turned up one day in a Harley Davidson motorcycle, and we got out the calibers and we measured it up because it actually looked like it was going to fit. And the poor chap thought, we're going to pinch his wheel, I think. <laughs> but, um, but it was a perfect fit and also gave us a spot to put a brake. So that was actually quite a unique design. So these are some of the challenges that were presented. And, you know, you'd wake in the middle of the night and you'd think of and the axles. We had to extend the axles. And there was little challenges that had come up all the time because we didn't have any plans. There was nothing to work on. Luckily, we had an original aeroplane, which we could work off. But, but some of these other little bits, there's the wheels there. They've come up a tree. Uh, I really am proud of them. We've got some um, um, uh, cover skin from them. Yeah, it's, it, it looks really, really neat. And, and people always comment on the wheels. Um, this goes back to the uh, video again, Brian. Yeah. Um, this is our, um, this is my first flight, and it was a pretty nervous day for everyone. Uh, I don't know whether any of you have done this, but this is a big one. And I'll just run through this a little bit of video. Very nervous time, this one. <laughs> Apologies for the vision there, um, it, it was just a handheld, someone had a camera and they took a shot of it and you know, we didn't even have a camera ready because we weren't really sure where they were going to be going at that time. Um, I took off and yeah, the aeroplane was quite unstable, um, you can just leave that for a sec, it won't come on for a sec. It was quite unstable and, um, and the radio was buzzing, it was doing that, you know, buzzing in my ear so I shut that off and, and it, was, it was trying to nose forward and it was all, it was all a bit ugly but we, we hung on and I went around to land on, on the grass runway um, at Serpentine 27 I think it is. I went around to land there, but I landed quite long because I, I, I wanted to have a fair bit of airspeed because we didn't know where it was going to stall. And so I had to go around and do it again. And we come back around and, um, and uh, landed back onto the bitumen runway. But because the wind, wheels had dropped down a bit by that, it, it grabs a bit, you know, and it was, oh, it was an ugly landing. It wasn't my best, but, but we survived it. And, uh, and that, was our, uh, that was our day of the first flight. It, it'll come up again now, Brian. to take it back to Beverly, as we mentioned. I, you know, we had quite a bit of repair work we needed to do, you know, there's lots of things I had to fix, but once we got that done, um, we, were, we were ready to go back to Beverly, and the ABC turned up again, and they, they did a little bit of a shoot. I've only pulled a little bit of it together, and, um, and uh, just to present today, just to show you the, uh, the crowd. There were many who thought the day would never come, but this afternoon, Beverly's backyard biplane touched down to a warm wheat belt welcome. It was the son and grandson of the aircraft's original builder. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> I thought it might have happened, but yeah, you know, it's a long time. It's back to the, back to the start. Yeah, and this is uh, what, 88 years or something, so 78 years since it was here last year. So it's quite a while. The Silver Centenary's next outing is a flight to Melbourne for the Avalon International Air Show, a trip that will take a lot longer than today's quick skip to Beverly.
Um, we put a crew together and we got this mad idea we're going to take this thing to Avalon and um, we got invited to come over and I thought it would be a good idea. My dad's on the, on the left there and George Cole and, and Rob Coffey. We took a support vehicle with us, um, we needed fuel. Um, the, the, the runways across the Malibu just didn't give us the, the distances that we needed to get the fuel. Um, myself and Rob were the first uh, to, to head off and um, we, uh, it was quite a warm day. We went in the afternoon on the Thursday, I believe, and it was about 35 degrees. We had full fuel, full passengers. It was you know, a heavy aeroplane, so it was going to be a, you know, quite, a, quite a big challenge down up over the, over the uh, trees, over the Darling Scarp. But, you know, interesting time this, you know, you're leaving seven time and I've gone to Beverly and I've done a few flights but this was this is a big one so we we're pretty nervous that's uh, that's seven time there. Um, we had a bit of company at the time with a couple of planes with us and um, they were supporting us on the way out. We slowly climbed out, it wasn't the best climb performance we've ever seen but we got there. Took it up to about three and a half and um, up over the trees and we're um <laughs> And um, I looked up and it was Avgas pouring out the bottom of the tank. It was flying out past and I thought, oh my God. You know, and, and so we we're obviously wanting to set down as quick as we could. Corrigan was only about five nautical in front, so we went for Corrigan. And while I was flying, it was okay because Avgas was coming past. And bearing in mind, I don't know whether you notice, that there's an exhaust pipe right there. And we're in a wooden aeroplane with fabric covering them. The world was a bit dangerous. Anyway, the chap that built the um, tank, we actually put a new tank on for the trip. And the chap that built it was Jamie, and he came up and helped us repair it. But we, we had to bunker down for the night, and um, and we thought we'd repaired it, we'd be right. And um, away we went for the next day. Um, George Cole jumped on board with us. It was a beautiful morning. It was crisp, clear. We are all excited. We had a bit of time off. You know, we weren't quite going to schedule, but we thought, we're well, away we go, and we are playing around with the um, with the wings just to see, you know, where we found our balance and everything. It was all good. And... Um, about um, five nautical mile in, I looked up again and dripped and dripped out the tank. And I thought, oh no! And we'd, we'd welded the tank. What had happened, the baffles were moving inside and then and it had cracked the tank, but we welded the baffles at the top. We thought we'd fixed it. But anyway, so the, the tank was leaking avgas again. Luckily, I said to the um, ground crew, I said, meet us at Condinen. If we're not there, you know, we've kept going to Wave Rock. And anyway, they got to Condinen and we were already really stopped and we were able to salvage the Avgas. The first lot we trucked 60 litres on the ground, mind you, which was all really nice, but um, this time we were able to put it back into the tank and we, we were bunkered at Condinen. And at this stage, you know, we were looking at each other thinking, well, is it all over? Is this it? You know, and um, it was pretty easy for us to give up. So I was pretty tempted, I must admit. Um, you know, it was pretty dangerous stuff what we were doing, but what we decided to do is we'll give it one more go. So Jamie flew up in his Cessna 172 with all the welding equipment, and also I got him to bring the old tank up. St George's Terrace camping. We've got uh, yeah, you can do that. inside the shed still a condemn. Copper in the corner. Got his little uh, bacon and eggs happening this morning. What a roll! We've even got over here, we've got a stretcher in case one of us falls foul of the, uh, on the injury list. Um, toilets in the corner, running water. Everything you need for camping, but to be honest, I'm a bit sick of condom. And it's uh, it's off to hopefully right. Uh, yeah. Hopefully. Hopefully we're the operative word, but, but uh, confidence, we've got to get some confidence in the camp. The camp's a bit flat. We need some uh, need some serious confidence. Yeah, it was a bit flat all right. <laughs> yeah, we got going again and um, we did take the um, we took the new tank, or the old tank with us. The new tank was back on the aeroplane, we repaired it, and away we went. Um, this is, uh, go back on that again. Come on. still, it's day two, it's an absolute disaster. Um, got the Lake Rock, uneventful, pretty good. Off to Lake Johnson, got to Lake Johnson, and we found another leak in the tank, and hearts all sink in our chest, but luckily enough, it's only a small leak, and we should get away. Off then, from there to Lake Johnson and Norseman, rough as, um, over the salt lakes, 
happens today knowing myself up. Um, it's a pretty hard trip actually, it's one of the toughest flights we've done. Then off to Baladonia, I think, from memory. Is that right? That's right, yeah, Baladonia. We were a bit confused, we did lots yesterday. Baladonia with uh, a copper across the trees, it was a bit scary going yeah. across the trees because we didn't have a real land, but um, his navigation skills were pretty good. We completed the GPS at one stage, which made me impressed. Um, got down to Caledonia early enough and we thought we'd probably be able to scut run through to Kaiguna. We left at what, half past five, um, last night was half past seven, so it was a race actually between the car and the plane on that leap. We had a car on it and um, we lulled them in a false sense of security early because we were climbing at 50 knots and the boys were in front of us and they thought they were homing hose and then uh, George Cole and Ron put the frog down and uh, gave them a bit of a touch up and next thing you know they were eating our dust. Um, beautiful flight, it was about three and a half of the way and, and just, yeah, lovely. Well, and George could put the camera right now and helped him to the speed in the chain because they broke the cockpit in the front. Um, and then we're getting to day four, we're still at Kraguna. As you can see, there's a bit of rain around us, the planes are wet. Um, there's a bit of a drizzly morning, the clouds are about a uh, thousand, it's about eight eighths, so not too flash. Um, so we're just hanging here for a bit. Hope to, uh, hope to get on to. Where are we going? Majura. Um, then we're looking at Eucla and then possibly on the Nullarbor Roadhouse or if we get lucky, Penong. But we did seven and a half hours in the cockpit yesterday, so we're thinking maybe six hours might be a good day today. And given that we're going to get on a reasonably late from this cloud, um, it's probably not possible to get Penong. So uh, we we'll report for uh, the day five uh, tomorrow. Thanks very much. Um. Yeah, and so around our camp short. Seven and a half hours in a cockpit that size, I can tell you. It's, it's not running out of fuel that hurts you, it's your bum. <laughs> <laughs> that was about the, that was the, the sticking point in all the trips, is how far my bum can handle it. I think the longest trip I did was three hours, and three hours hanging onto it all the way. It's, um, there was someone there that flew across to um, the UK and I tried them off here. Yeah. My God, I can't believe you've done that. You know, that's just amazing. It's, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite a challenge. This is uh, rough. Just go back on that drive. <coughs> we, uh, we beat the car just there. That's what I think. A bit cheeky. Morning, the race is always a race. Desert country. Beautiful mate. Low cloud, but uh, we beat the car by about a minute. That's the runway. It doesn't look like a runway, but it is. And uh, I ran into the desert. Well, we'll come back to Majura because that's on the way home. It's, it's quite nice. So I know about from here. This is Euclid. Euclid Airport, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we just pulled in behind a shed. And uh, as we can see, no tank on a plane. Another tank disaster. Up. This, is, this, is, this is quite a challenge at that point. Everyone was pretty flat, but when you do a flight like this, after having all those problems, and you can see those cliffs, and you're flying along in a dingy airplane, like people taking pictures of you, you know, going past, and there's cliffs. I don't know who, those of you that have flown across the bike, but it is pretty special. It's, um, it's, it's something else. And, you, know, you can see that the pictures just don't do it justice. Um, yeah, it's a little bit of low cloud around, I think, but it was still just absolutely lovely. Just uh, put in a bed for the night. We're at at uh, Nullarbor Roadhouse and a uh, nice little camping area. Bit of rain overnight, so she's a bit boggy on land, and we uh, we had a bit of trouble taxing in. So, but a pretty good spot. We should better get away on the pitch in the morning. So, all's good and uh, successful day. We had to change another tank, which has been really annoying. But we've got the old tank on the old trusty tank now, so hopefully she'll be fine for tomorrow. Four inches of rain, mate. 
Oh, it'd be a bit dodgy tomorrow. I'm going to start to try and find a way out of here. It's not like we're going to have to break the rules and go down the bitchman run. <laughs> You better run with this one, this is, this is, sorry. Lethbridge the night before Avalon. Lethbridge is about 20 nautical miles from Avalon and um, 
and uh, there was a good group of people there, and they all had knowledge about getting into Avalon because I don't really know about these air shows, but there's planes coming from everywhere, and it was really going to be quite a challenge for us. Um, so what we decided to do is we tag on with them. We camp at night, and we we tag on with them in the morning. And um, you've got to go in a place called um, past a place called Anarchy, and there's a Barwon prison there. And this is the prison where Brendan Abbott was extracted out by an air, um, by a helicopter. So I reckon they're a bit nervous about planes flying over over this spot. And um, anyway, so we went out in a very loose formation with the, with the guys, and, and we're coming over this um, barn prison, and my engine started to cough. And I'm thinking, my God, you know, we come 1,600 nautical mile, I got 20 to go, and she's she's given us a bit of a cough. I think with all the fuel tank changes, you've got a bit of bit of dirt in the car. And I'm thinking, am I going to crash in this prison, or am I going to get shot? And then all of a sudden, the old girl just came back to life. I went, oh, we're back. And um, and so we headed on into uh, into Avalon, and it was. You know, to, to have dropped down that close would have just been, and that, that was the trip, you know, everything that could have been thrown at us was thrown at us and, uh, and we were able to you know, come up to the challenge. Um, Avalon's a huge big airport, it's unbelievable the size of it, I think I was going to land it across it. In fact, actually on the way out I did actually take off on a bit of an angle because it was a crosswind, but it was a huge big thing. The marshals were all there and they marshaled you in and, and we had these sort of airplanes sitting next to us and, 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 and the big A380 was there. And here I am chugging chuck along, chug, chug, chug underneath this airplane. And this B1 bomber, this thing was just, I reckon it used more fuel when he's turned it over than what I did for the whole trip. So it was unbelievable. And they put us up, we parked near the uh, Antiquas uh, tent and next to Kev Bailey's big Stinson. And, right, and Kev was there actually, so he uh, welcomed us there. Oh, the old economy, that was beautiful. Um, yeah, so we're, anyway, we're at this, at this um, site and it was all pretty good. And then the Saturday night they had an award called the Congors de Elegance, and I'm sure you've all heard of it. Um, and um, and we we're up for an award, and then they sort of enticed us to, uh, to attend this award. But what I didn't know, there was a big storm that night. We we're in this tent, and the whole roof of the tent was moving. I thought, oh my God. So we ran down to find out whether the aeroplane had gone, you know, because the wind was 160 kilometres an hour. We got down, and this tent had blown over right in front of my aeroplane. And I could see Kev Stinson there, and I was running along with it. And see in the distance the fire truck down just behind it's my aeroplane. I got up there and the aeroplane was in, intact. I, was on the, I just thought, oh my god, how good is this? But then I looked up and, and bang, we had some damage to the top wing. One of the big poles of the tent had flown up and gone whack straight through my top wing and broken the tailing edge and a couple of ribs. So realistically, though, when I looked around, I was actually probably one of the one of the ones that were better better off. And you can see some of the vision here of some of the other planes. And we tied ours down with these huge big stakes. I my dad had a bit of a go about the, uh, about putting these stakes, but I wasn't prepared to let my aeroplane blow away. And, and this is what happened if you didn't. Um, there was some absolute disasters there. You know. Imagine seeing the aeroplane like that. So you're all over your you, you know how you feel. That was a write off, that, that was a um, kit box. Was, was it? In that renegade, Peter Franks owned that renegade. He was from Lethbridge, and we got to know him. He's actually since restored it back. But we won the award that, that night. We actually did win the award. We won the antique one as also the, the Champion of Champions Award. So I kind of it was bittersweet, you know, we were really excited about winning the award, but we had damage to our to our aeroplane, which was um yeah, it was quite sad. Um we had to wait about oh, I think it was about three months to get the trip back home again. We had to try and find a window of opportunity. It was going to be winter. We obviously went over the summer, but we're coming back in the winter. You can see there how rugged up it was. I think it was minus four one day when it was up there. It was absolutely freezing in this open um, it, was, it wasn't. It wasn't ideal. We weren't intending obviously to go this late, but we had to because of the um, because of the damage that we had to the aeroplanes. Um, oh, is that we um, we decided that we'd go from um, Thai Ave in Victoria, where they repaired the aeroplane, and we'd um, bring that across to. Um, bring that across to Lethbridge and then head off from Lethbridge that next day and, and it was a freezing cold day. That was down at Tyre. We did some photo shoot down there before we left. Um, Rob Fox did that for the latest Flight Path magazine. I don't know if you've seen it yet, but it's in the latest Flight Path magazine. Mm. And we got the same crew together. Um, and uh, But what we decided to do is the guys would meet us on the other side of the Gulf. So I was going to be on my own in the aeroplane with all my supplies in the front and I was going to do the, the legs up to the other side into Nineveh where that is there. And I'd meet the guys. So that saved them coming up around the Gulf and back down the other side. About 2,000 k's it was going to save. So we headed off from Lethbridge. I was on my own. It was freezing cold. It was quite damp. And um, off to uh, off to Hamilton was my first stop. Um, she didn't want to start that day. You might just want to bring it up now, Brian. You got it, Brian? Yep. No, the um, uh, mic. Yep. The mic. Oh, yeah, 200. And uh, 
Hey. Yeah, that's it, I'm sorry, you missed that. Bit. Basically, we got to, um, you're right, Ron? Yep. We got to Hamilton and um, it was raining and I got stuck in a hangar and that was the first day of the year I was going, here we go. But yeah, the conditions weren't too bad. It was like clouds, there was a bit of rain around, but it wasn't actually too bad. It was just cold, really cold, and I was, I was pretty rugged up. But um, as you can see, there was a fair bit of rain around. We had a bit of an ignition problem. Um, when I got to Narracourt and the chaps there helped me out with, the, with it at Narracourt and we'd met a couple over in um, Avalon and they decided they wanted to fly back with us in this little project, that's them there, Ian and Sue Somerville, and they had this little project team too, so I actually had a bit of company from Narracourt through to, through for the rest of the way, which was great because I was in the aeroplane on my own, you know, and a vintage aeroplane, it was really quite a challenge, so they, they come, come back with us, we went up through Murray Bridge um, through the wine region, which is just, that's very pretty through there to, to be flying across the top of the, um, of the um, mountains there and across the Gulf and into, this is back into South Australia. When we actually got to Minipa, which is in, you know, on the other side of the Gulf, the guys had had problems with the, the ute, they'd actually had a problem with their trailer and they'd left the same day as I'd left. We actually ended up arriving in Minipa within two minutes of each other. <laughs> Can you believe that? It was just quite amazing that we, we turned up there. And so it was, a pretty, it was a pretty exciting day and it's great to see the guys because you know I'd been on my own all this time until Ian and Sue met with us and so it was going to be a bit of a, um, a you know a bit of a lonely old trip without them and uh, and then we had our supplies to get across the, uh, the Nullarbor. That's it, uh, Penong, yeah that was quite interesting. That's the, that's the airstrip, there's no actual runway there, it's just a paddock. And the only reason you know it's a runway is because of the wind song. <laughs> that's about it, it's only going to land where you like. There, there you go, that's, that's the runway I'm on now. <laughs> there was whales there, where we were, that was coming into the, um, into the bike, and there was 50 whales, we counted. It was, oh, it was unbelievable. Yeah, and that was right next to the another wall. Look at that, you know, that's almost been a teary eye flying in there. Dad, we, my dad was flying there, we were sneaking out and out and out, and sort of like, come back, come back, come back. I wasn't too keen on being too far away from the cliff. Um, this is at uh, Majura, we mentioned earlier, and, and we got back to Majura and we, a front was coming across, so we knew we were going to get bunkered down. We got absolutely soaked, we had to hang out all our, all our clothes and all our, all our gear. But we thought we'd bunker down for the day and we decided we'd, we'd head out the next morning. Um, we've got a nice fire going and it was pretty cold. I, I was the one that was going to take off first and I'll go out and just check the wind and see how much headwind we had because it was a bit marginal as to whether we could make it to, to uh, Kaiguna. There was cocklebitty in the middle. but. Anyway, I took off and um, it was all good and all of a sudden I had this almighty thud with the uh, engine and I was running on three cylinders and I was thinking, oh my God, I was about 800 feet and I could just hold my, hold my um, altitude and we came around we thought we might have had a foul plug. What well, plugs it? Because we're on, obviously you've got two, um, two, but when we looked, you can see there, there's something missing uh, called, a, called a valve. <laughs> um, yeah. So what had happened is the valve, I won't bore you, but it had sheared the collet and dropped the valve onto the piston. Um, which is not a really good thing to happen on the Nullarbor. Um, so we did a, a little bit of a trick. We thought we'd, we'd bring that, the valve back up, so we shoved rope in so I didn't and compress the piston up and brought the valve up and put, and I actually had another set of collets and springs and everything on it. We put it on, but it was bent, the valve was bent, so we didn't have compression. Luckily enough, the guys couldn't believe it, I actually had a spare valve with me, which you know you do when you have a vintage aeroplane, you have a spare valve. And so we took the head off on the Nullarbor, and there it is there, and um, we all chipped in and we, uh, we put the new valve, well not new, it was a second hand valve in, um, it wasn't really seated that well. There wasn't, you know, a heap of compression. It was enough to, to hopefully get us home. And so, uh, yeah, it was it wasn't a very good day that one. But um, we, we got away again and um, and uh, off to. Um, you can leave that down, Brian, if you want. Um, we went off to um, Kaiguna, and um, there was still a headwind, but it was quite a bit flight that one. We were down fairly low because the cloud was up, and the trucks were down there, and I was following the trucks, and because the airspeed was about the same as the truck. They were having a hell of a lot of fun playing with me because I was, I was waving to them, they were tooting the horns with them. Yeah, it was pretty exciting. And um, when I got to Kaiguna, it was um, it was quite a. Um, yeah, turn it down there, you're right for now, Brian. Um, we got to Kaigoon, it was quite cold, and I thought, well, gee, I, I, I could dine for a coffee. So I was there, um, and we didn't have the chocks to the um, aeroplane, and, um, and so I put some rocks under the front wheels, because the other guys, the other couple, Ian and Sue had gone off down to the, um, I don't know where you'd been to Kaigoon, but the runways, the taxiways are fairly up to the service station. They'd already gone, and so I was on my own to start the aeroplane. 
And um, anyway, I cranked the aeroplane over and I had the throttle set a bit high, which you can imagine what's happened. The aeroplane starts moving in it and it's starting to go down the taxiway. And um, I just thought, well, what am I going to do here? This is it here. And, oh, there's a bit of vision on it, but you'll see the tracks. What I did is I grabbed the wing and the aeroplane was going around like this. And I'm going to go around like this. And so I sort of worked my way towards the middle and I was able to dive over and grab the, grab the throttle and pull the throttle back. But imagine, yeah, you can see the skid marks. Oh, oh you imagine that. I was absolutely white as a ghost when I'm turned up. And the thing. I was white as a ghost. What happened? Oh, nothing. <laughs> but I think they worked it out pretty quick. Um, that's, that's a Norseman on the way home. It was minus four when we woke up that morning. Starting an aeroplane minus four when it backfires and hits you on the knuckles. A grown man cries. I can tell you, I actually <laughs> cried it. It was unbelievable. This thing wouldn't start. And it cracked me on the back of the knuckles. But we made it back and, we, you know, coming over to, um, coming over the hill back into Serpentine after this big trip, you imagine the emotion of it. And I had my dad in the front, which is great, you know. We pulled up and it was just, yeah, it was, it was a big day, that one. And we'd actually made it back with, a, with the faulty valve in there as well. Um, and uh, so it was quite a challenge and, uh, and uh, quite an adventure for us. But... Uh, yeah, so that's my that's my silver centenary, centenary story in about 50 minutes, I hope. Um, 43.45 minutes. Um, sorry about the vision and everything. We, we really weren't sure how it was going to go, but hopefully, hopefully you've you've had a bit of enjoyment out of it. And, uh, any questions? Oh, sorry, sorry, just Have a look at this landing. I like you don't need the bottom, but have a look at the landing. <laughs> oh, poor Ian, he's, he's not a very good pilot, I didn't want to tell him that he was... <laughs> hey John, what about that picture over there? What is that? That's, um, that's over Tyab, um, and it's, there's a reservoir as you go into a beautiful little airstrip. That's where I got the aeroplane repaired. Um, and um, the chap who took that was Rob Fox, who's the editor of the, uh, the Flight Path magazine. And we're in that one. I promised him I wouldn't use it until, until he put his magazine out, and that's just out now. And then there's the Champion of Champions Award, that's that one there, and that's the, um, the best overall vintage award as well, but you can have a look later anyway, but that's, that's the awards that we got. So, um, yeah, as I said, I, I'm, I appreciate the awards now, but at the time it was a little bit, a bit ugly. Do you, always, well, do you always do wheel landings? Do I do wheeler landings? Yes, I have done. Um, I, I, I can do three pointers, and, um, but it's, it just, because the wheels, the undercarriage, you notice she yeah. drops down a bit, and what happens is as you land, she sort of goes that way and that way. And on the grass and the gravel, it's easy because it just drags it out. But on the, on the bitumen, she's a bit of a handful. So I tend, to, I tend to wheel her on. And with a crosswind, the wheel is the only way. Yeah. Where did you get the motor from? Um, yeah, that's an interesting story. The engine came out of a east-west air race. Now, there's, um, Phil McCulloch has just done, a, um, I think it's McCulloch, it's just done an article about it. So I think it'll be uh, in the press soon. And there was a race in 1929. And... Um, the um, uniform x-ray, I can't remember the registration, but it was a gypsy, and they had this race. And it was an interesting story because the chap, um, it was uh, Pratt and uh, Whitney were in the plane, and they had a, another gypsy coming past, and they were a bit nervous about it. And this was out at Kelleberon, at the Barndee Lakes. And, um, and they could see this guy passing, and they were down really low to get away from the headwind. And so they were down so low, and they were watching the, as they were getting past, and whack, they hit a tree, uh, one tree. <laughs> I'm, t I'm thinking they hit a tree and they, they crashed at the, um, at the Barndee Lakes. The engine was removed from the aeroplane in, in, the, in the force of the crash. They both survived, which was quite amazing. And so my grandfather heard about it and he went up and purchased the engine for £170. <laughs> and uh, that's the engine, yeah. It's a 1928 Gypsy One, yeah, the original. Yeah. Yep. Were, were the trucks going past you? It actually, it's funny you say that because the chap that I was racing, it was a toll, a big B-double, big thing, and it was that section of the road, there's just a couple of kinks in it, and I went straight and he was going. So when he went the kinks, I went past, and then he'd come under me, he'd go past, and then he'd kink, and I'd go past, and in fact, he came and saw me, you know, when we landed at Kaigoon, and he said, oh, mate, I cannot believe we've done this, you know, because I was only 300 feet, I could read his number plate, I was so low. So, and so, so what are the aircraft performances? Cruise speed, high speed? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, big, um, we average 65 knots on the trip over. Um, yeah, which is not a lot. Um, that's why the car could beat us sometimes. Now, obviously, we didn't have a lot of tailwinds because you never get tailwinds. There's aviators, you'd normally know that. Um, and um, we landed about oh, probably 45 over the fence, 50 on approach, 
stalls at about, oh, I don't know, the airspeed indicator didn't go down far enough, but it's about 20, <laughs> 22 or something like that. I don't know what the official figure is. I've tried to measure it with the GPS, but obviously you've got wind and stuff. So, um, But the airspeed indicators are 1912, so it's sort of, yeah, it doesn't quite. It's a bit ambitious. In fact, the airspeed indicator goes to 200 mile an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know when we're ever going to get there. <laughs> Who paid for it? Who paid for it? All the three of you. Oh, shit, I'm the bloke that hasn't got any money. <laughs> there's a donation bin over there. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, yeah, there's a lot of dollars there. That's uh, Yep. Are you aware? No, I'm not. In fact, that's got a funny story about it in itself because my grandfather had VHU, as you would have seen in some of the black and white photos, except for the ones that Jonathan Beale did from the ABC that made them look black and white, but you could see the red over there. But, um, so we had VHU and then Silver Centenary. I wanted SC and I, I was able to get it, which is, yeah, quite amazing. But he wasn't ever able to get the last two letters because he didn't get it registered. In fact, we got very close to not getting this registered either. If I didn't have Stephen Dimes um, as my authorised person, we would have spent a lot of money on a museum piece because I wouldn't have been able to fly it, which would have been just devastating. Um, but luckily, Stephen, I, the issue they had was that I wasn't the primary builder. My grandfather was. And so they had an issue with that, but we kind of worked it out that I was the primary builder as well. So that's how we got away with it. Stephen basically told Cass, he said, you've got to let this thing fly. And they said, yeah, OK. And we did. So, which is amazing. Imagine not being able to do this. It's just, you know, spend all that money and oh, it would have been devastating. Did somebody actually have so, to test so, the aircraft? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> 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 that was the test. Yeah. So you didn't have to have that aeronautical engineer to actually test No, it. under the experimental category, there's a few things that they've got to have. Right. Um, there's a few plaques and things you've got to have, you know, warnings and all the rest of it. You've got to have proper controls and there's a, uh, you've got to have a radio and there's a few things you have to have. And obviously we ticked all those off, but in terms of the test flying, that was it. You just saw me test flight, and that was probably the scariest day of my life. You know, you go down the taxiway, and I'd done a few runs, obviously over the over the months before, and I'd done some tiger moth flying with JD if he's here somewhere. He taught me how to fly the fly the tiger, and um, and uh, yeah, going down the runway, and you sort of ease off and think, oh god, is this going to work? And you can sort of feel the weight coming on the wings, and I thought, oh, you know, even though it was a bit ugly to fly, it was just you know we were there. And, yeah, wow, what a day that was. You can see the emotion, it was just quite amazing. That registration in 1938, that was on a VH86 yeah. uh, belonging to Qantas. There was one or two that was flown to MMA before they got the Lockheed 10s. Yeah. And they were VH USC and USD. Oh, wow, yeah, that's good, isn't it? I didn't know that. That's, uh, I actually didn't even research the Reggio, I was just happy to get it. Yeah. Uh, what was the uh, capacity of your fuel tank and how many hours uh, could you do yep, for a okay. fuel tank? Well, the replacement fuel tank was the one that gave us all the trouble, which is now back on the aeroplane. We've, we've done a bit more work on it. It's got 100 litres and we're chewing about 25 an hour. So, you yeah, know, we had a fair bit of time. But as I said, the only real range was, was how far my butt can handle in a cane seat. Because they've got cane seats in it. I don't know if you've noticed, well, you probably wouldn't have seen it in the vision, but it's got cane wicker seats. The original aeroplane have wicker seats, so we've, we've, we've restored them as well. Yeah. But I have got harnesses. <laughs> I have got that. So yeah. I'd uh, tell you, back in 92, I had to... Uh, I, I was taking the first aircraft that had ever been built by school kids across the Avalon Air Show. And uh, I couldn't land at Sojuna because the winds were so strong uh, and the runway, only one way closely in the wind was a taxiway. Uh, and the other, or the other runway, which I could have used, had been was covered in flood water or whatever. So I had to turn around and go back to where I'd seen this paddock with runways graded across or harvested across it at the Nong, and I landed there and subsequently couldn't find the owner, but met him in the pub that night. When <laughs> uh, he asked when he came over to us and said, "Is that your list of you talking? Is that your airplane in my paddock?" <laughs> Um, and he told me that when he was a kid, um, Sir Norman Brealey, or it wasn't Sir Norman at the time, but, but Norman Brealey uh, had had that strip. His father, I think it was, had, had uh, been uh, approached by Brealey to 
cut these runways there in case aircraft got into trouble coming across the desert yeah. uh, and, and uh, were unable to get into Sojourner. So your historical aeroplane landed on in another bit of history, as yeah. much as the man behind you up there on the wall had arranged for Phnom to be actually uh, yeah. uh, put there. And by the way, this guy told me when he was 11 years old, one of Greeley's aircraft came in and landed, in fact he thinks it was Greeley flying it, and turned over in, uh, at, at the bottom of the, of, of the runway, you remember that? Yeah, they go down, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was he a turned, motorbike track there, yeah, someone was jumping. Turned it over and, uh, and the passengers had to extricate themselves upside down. I went back to my book written by Sir Norman Greeley. You know, it wasn't even mentioned. He, um, I can't imagine what. I think it's the, is that yeah, the really, so was he the controller of civil aviation for a little no, while? No, that was Brimsmead. That's Brimsmead. That was Brimsmead. Sorry, a different one, yeah. Yeah, well, actually, that one at uh, Nullarbor, what had happened is there was a thunderstorm um, the day before when we got there, and um, the air, um, the strips were all wet, and there is a road there, which used to be a runway, but they use it as a road now, and we were going to put down the road, but there was, a, at the top end of the strip, there was about oh, 300, 400 feet, <coughs> so I thought oh, I could do that. So we actually landed on the top of the, the runway, and I pulled up with plenty of time because you don't need a lot. And, and but when we taxied down, it was quite boggy and ugly, and they, we got in a bit of trouble. So the next morning, we decided we'd take off on the road, and I think we got in more trouble when we did that. But anyway, um, <laughs> we thought it was the best option to get out of there. Yeah, yeah. That um, Eucla Airport is, is is quite interesting because you can see you would have saw it in the vision. There's runways and taxiways yeah. everywhere. You yeah. take your pick. Yeah. Is that the one down by the coast? By the coast, yeah. yeah, that's, where, yeah that's, that's where that shed was. That's where we moved. Yeah. Because there's another one up the road. Yeah, there's another one up the top at the border village, yeah. yeah. Any others? What sort of compass did you use? The it's at Serpentine. Um, I've just, as I said, the engine's out of it at the moment. We're just doing a bit of work on that. But um, yeah, you'll see it around. We'll, we'll get it going again and, and, and do some more flying. Um, the question down here was the compass. Yeah, yeah um, we actually cheated a bit. We used a GPS. <laughs> um, but one day the GPS batteries went flat and it was actually going from Penong, I think, from memory. And um, yeah, it was going from Penong and then I had my dad in the front. No, Nullable Roadhouse. I had my dad in the front and it was quite a cloudy day. It was about eight eights and we went up over the top of it um, through a hole and there was a couple of holes and we thought we were pretty good up here. But then my GPS went flat and so I had to get out the old maps. But dad had them in the front. And I said, oh, can you pass me back those maps? And I was a bit nervous about this anyway. He passed me back, <laughs> <laughs> broke off. And, and I looked down and I had this little skinny piece of map about that big. And it was the bit I needed. Was it? <laughs> Couldn't you believe it? So, so we decided we better get back down where we can see. And so we used the map and, and we, we made it all right. So the old dead reckoning, you know. Was, yeah. So, yeah, the GPS was a bit of a cheat. But anyway. <laughs> what was the sort of compass you had? Oh, we've got a compass in it, yes. Yeah, we've got a modern compass in it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Some of the instruments, most of the instruments are original. Um, the oldest we've got is a 1904 airspeed indicator. Um, it's nine, no, no, not the airspeed. Yeah, the one in the front is 1904, and it was um, serviced in 1918. And then now it's back down again. So it's yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's not quite accurate. It's um, telling us we're doing 150 k's an hour, which is probably not quite right. Yeah, yeah, not far off. That's it. Yep. Very good. Thanks, Pete. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Sorry about the sound system. Uh, I tested it, and it seemed to work, but it didn't perform today. A bit like your petrol tank. Just didn't measure up. <laughs> um, yeah, it just goes to prove what you can do with a uh, bit of guts and determination and a dash of old world charm, eh? <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Now, I, I deliberately asked um, about the origin of the motor because uh, I knew where it came from and had the circumstance, and that's why I'm, that's why I'm getting... John was to come up and move the motor thanks because he came from quite close from where it uh, came to grief. Thanks, John. Thank you, Brian. Is that working for you? Uh, uh,
that working now? Yes, yeah. probably sounds what it is. Well, look, I'm very pleased to pass this private thanks to. Uh, what? Um, and I did some research on the internet, my use found skills to get the history of this aircraft and the flight, and much of that's been covered. With the exception of the accident, the details of the accident occurred at Barn D. That's the area I was born into a few years later, and memories of aircraft accidents ran for a long while, and it's still well known in that district, because some locals actually got pieces of the aircraft to retain as a souvenir. But from what I have established, the plane crashed at about 10.30. A pony called Gigney were on the scene almost immediately. Fortunately, Mrs. Gigney was a trained nurse, and apparently Guthrie, the co-pilot, his life was due to her skills as a nurse. But in 10.30, by 11.15, the local doctor was in Calabaran, some 20 miles away. Today, I don't think you get the local Calabaran doctor 20 miles out in three quarters of an hour. By one o'clock, the, the patients were transferred to the Calabaran Hospital, and by three o'clock, a specialist surgeon from Perth was flying up in a tiger moth to Calabaran Hospital, where he operated on Yathi, who was severely injured. And he, they both survived, and that's the history of the aircraft and the engine, which is now not in Rod's aeroplane at the moment, but will be eventually, I think. Now, uh, anyone that's flown across the North Warren Wright aircraft would be able to identify with the many of the locations that Rod mentioned. Um, and I think he did an excellent job of describing just how many hazards uh, there available uh, can confront you on that sort of flight. Uh, we certainly enjoy it and we hope that uh, the self-centenary really hasn't gone into history. It's still living, living history to a unique part of Western Australia's aviation. And thanks Rod again. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes today's meeting. It's been a marvellous meeting in numbers and uh, in the subject that was covered. And uh, I'd like to wish you all um, a very happy Christmas and New Year. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again early in 2010.